Starting in June, July 1863, the tide begins to turn, at least temporarily, toward uh, the Union. Lee, Robert E. Lee, makes this, sometimes people say, tremendous blunder, sometimes people say tremendous gamble of invading the North. Bring, and, you know, on the one hand, he says, why should I just sit here and have northern armies, one after another, come down and attack me? I should go on the offensive. Invade the North. If Lee can win a battle on northern soil, it will further destroy morale in the North. Maybe he'll be able to capture Washington. And who knows what will happen then. So Lee brings his great army of northern Virginia. You can see on the map, north through Virginia, through Maryland, up into Pennsylvania. The first Confederate invasion, really, he had been in Maryland before, but now he's up in Pennsylvania. One of his aims is to destroy the Pennsylvania Railroad, which is one of the major uh, east-west links uh, 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 in the north, of course. And uh, so at the end of June, beginning of July, Lee's army is there and followed or tracked by the Union Army, now under the command of General George Meade, who was replaced. Lincoln has been trying out commanders for two years, and none of them ever really work out. And somehow, these two armies, unintended, uh, I mean, that is to say, they didn't intend to meet there, meet at this tiny little town of Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. I don't know how they did that. It's impossible to get to Gettysburg even today. <laughs> Try it. it. You can't get there. They got there somehow. And uh, you, there's no airport, the train is miles away, the highways are all clogged with trucks, I don't know. Anyway, so they come together in Gettysburg, July 1st to 3rd, 1863, where they fight the greatest battle, not only of the Civil War, but in the entire history of the Western Hemisphere. The biggest battle in the entire human history of the Western Hemisphere is the Battle of Gettysburg. Uh, you can read about it. I'm not going to give you a blow-by-blow blow account. There are multi-volume accounts of the Battle of Gettysburg. It's three days. The first day, the Union lines are very <laughs> endangered, but somehow hold. Second day is a sort of a stalemate. The third day, of course, Lee, as the gambler of Southern manpower, sends this you know, giant force of, uh, under uh, his uh, subordinate picket in so-called Pickett's Charge across with thousands of men across this field at the entrenched Union lines. And of course, Pickett's Charge, sometimes called the high tide of the Confederacy, is repulsed with tremendous casualties. Uh, Lee finds just what the Union army had found over and over again. It is very difficult to be on the attack in this war. It is very difficult to overrun an entrenched army armed with modern rifles, cannons, etc. It's easy to defend in a position. It's very hard to overrun it. Um, General Longstreet, his lieutenant, urged not that they said this was a big mistake. You should not send these troops across this. It's a death trap. Longstreet said, let us, retreat, let us swing our army around and place ourselves between Meade and Washington. Then Meade will have to attack us to save Washington. But Lee did not, uh, you know, didn't go with that advice. And at the end of the battle, the Union was in control of the field. Lee had to retreat out of Pennsylvania. Never again would he set foot, or his army set foot, on northern soil. Each side had about 4,000 dead in the Battle of Gettysburg. 4,000 dead is the entire casualties of the American Revolution. So you see what, how the magnitude of warfare has... Uh, has expanded in the Civil War. 20,000 wounded and missing on each side. This was manpower that Lee could not afford to lose. But nonetheless, he gambled, lost. And to his great credit, at the end of the battle, Lee said, it is all my fault. It is all my fault. In other words, this was a guy who took responsibility for what he did. Our political leaders today, not a single one of them does that. They apologize for things they didn't do, like Tony Blair apologizing for the Irish famine, you know. But when it comes to things they did do, <laughs> they, find, uh, they find excuses. They, find, they, they get spin men to, 
to show that they really weren't responsible. It, is all my, it was all my fault. I give Lee credit for taking responsibility for his decision. Now, I don't know how many people here have actually visited the battlefield of Gettysburg. If not, if you can find it, it's a very interesting place <laughs> to visit. Um, no, it's very interesting. Millions of people go there. Millions of people go there every year. And it's worth visiting, obviously. My uh, connection with Gettysburg began uh, some years ago when uh, my daughter was uh, spending the summer in a ballet camp in Carlisle, which is nearby. And my wife and I visited her, and I said, well, what are we going to do this weekend, parents' weekend? And I said, you know, we're going to do, well, let's go to visit the Gettysburg battlefield. This did not elicit enthusiasm. But <laughs> since I was driving, that's where we went. Um, <laughs> And um, this was, uh, I had actually not been there before, and I was actually kind of surprised by the treatment of history at Gettysburg at that point, because it was all what they call site-specific, which is fine. In other words, it showed you in tremendous detail the battle, the three-day battle, the disposition of forces, all the movement, great. But there was not a single mention of what they were fighting about. There was no historical context whatsoever. Why were these guys here fighting? What was the issue? The word slavery was never mentioned in the entire Gettysburg uh, uh, setup. Slave, slavery, or, and not even the fact that there were free black farmers around there who had to flee the oncoming Confederate army. And if they didn't, they were captured and sent into slavery. The Confederate Army grabbed any black person it could find and sent them into slavery. And these were free people in Pennsylvania. So that wasn't mentioned either as part of what was going on in Gettysburg. Um, well, I, uh, as, uh, as someone who likes to complain, I sent a letter actually to someone I knew in the National Park Service complaining about the treatment of history at Gettysburg. Oh, and also uh, in a semiotic kind of way, in the labels and of paintings, I noticed that the word valor or glory was only used when they were referring to Confederate soldiers. In other words, the, it was part of this idea that the Southerners were courageous men, which they were, but in the North, they, the North it was just, you know, machinery and, you know, it was like they were just ground down by automatons. So there was no glory in fighting for the nation. There was only glory in fighting for the Confederacy. So I sort of complained about that, too. Anyway, right at that time, Congressman Jesse Jackson, Jr., unfortunately in jail nowadays, but back then an upstanding <laughs> citizen, was um, he got Congress to pass, this is in the 90s, I guess, to pass a law directing the National Park Service to revamp its treatment of slavery in national parks. Make sure it's up to date. And this gave the opportunity to revamp Gettysburg, or at least it was a direction from Congress to revamp places. And so if, to make a long story short, it was too late for that already. Um, the, uh, you know, I was on a committee with James McPherson, greatest star in Princeton, Nina Silva from Boston, where we gave a lot of advice. And eventually, a whole new visitor center was built, which is very good now, with a big museum about, it's mostly about the battle, but it is contextualized. Why did the war come in the first place? And things like that. So anyway, it's well worth visiting, and um, I urge you to do so if you happen to be down around there. I also spent, spoke a lot to, they have all these guides, what they call licensed guides, who take people around the battlefield and, you know, explain what happened. Which, and the guides told us all sorts of funny stories about questions people asked. Uh, for example, um, where were the German lines? That's one. <laughs> you know, that, that's World War II. Oh, that's one. Or another good. See, the, in, uh, all on the battlefield are statues, monuments to all the different units who fought there. They're all over the place. So some people say, well, didn't these monuments get in the way of the troops when they were fighting? You know? <laughs> but the best one was the visitor who asked, why did all these Civil War battles take place in national parks? <laughs> Gettysburg later became very important in American law in a famous Supreme Court case at the end of the century about because in order to build this park there, 
uh, they had to seize or the state had to take land, private property, through eminent domain. You know, they were people who owned land around and they wanted to put it in as part of the national park. So they seized it under eminent domain and property owners said, no, that's not a public use. In other words, you know, the eminent domain is a principle. If they want to build a highway, they can take your land and pay you for it, right, if it's a public use. Is a national site commemorating a Civil War battle proper public use for eminent domain? And the Supreme, this went all the way to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said, yes, it is. The commemoration of, of things like the Battle of Gettysburg is important to the nation. It's important to our consciousness. It's important to what it is to be an American. So you can seize private property for this purpose. It sort of expands eminent domain, et cetera. Um, Gettysburg, the Gettysburg reunion of 1913, the 50th anniversary reunion of very, very elderly people who had fought in the battle is often seen as a kind of great symbol. It, it, you, in the Ken Burns TV series, he makes a big deal of it. You know, old timers shaking hands across the uh, wall at uh, Pickett's Charge. But it, it comes to be seen, and we'll, at the very end of the term, we'll see this as a kind of symbol of white reconciliation, North and South. There were no black soldiers at Gettysburg. Uh, they were not yet in the Army of the Potomac. So the reunion is white reunion, and by 1913, as we will see, it had you know, become very, very prominent in American culture. And of course, finally, um, as you know, and we talked about, Lincoln travels to Gettysburg in November 1863 to dedicate this military cemetery that is created there and gives the speech we talked about last week about democracy, about equality, about the meaning of the nation. Um, distilling his ideas in a very brief way about what the war is all about. But it's worth noting that the Gettysburg Address does not become the quintessential Lincoln until much later on. When Lincoln dies, he's remembered for emancipation. It's part of the reconciliation move in later in the century that emancipation recedes and the Gettysburg Address becomes Lincoln's greatest moment because the word slavery is not mentioned in the Gettysburg Address. He does talk about a new birth of freedom, and people knew what he was talking about, but the word slavery is not in there. 